Hi everyone, I'm Tyler Starr and I'm a postdoc in Jesse Bloom's group at the Fred Hutch in Seattle, Washington. And I'm excited to talk to you today about the various ways we've been using deep mutational scanning to understand the functional evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. So this image here on the left is a depiction of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, a notable feature of which is its surface spike glycoprotein. A key feature of spike is the receptor binding domain or RBD, which is an autonomously folding domain that sits buried at the spike apex, and this is the domain that enables binding to host cell ACE2 receptors. This binding between the RBD and ACE2 on host target cells is what ultimately leads to fusion of the viral and host membranes and the initiation of cellular infection. So because this interaction between the RBD and ACE2 receptor is so important, the RBD holds a central role in the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 and related coronaviruses. For example, evolution of RBD to interact with divergent host ACE2 receptors is central to the poor species boundaries that exist within the family of SARS-related coronaviruses. And the RBD is also the target of some of the most potently neutralizing antibodies, which bind to the RBD and inhibit this interaction with ACE2 to thereby block cellular infection. So given the importance of the RBD in the evolution and immunology of these viruses, we sought to use deep mutational scanning to characterize the effects of mutations on various biochemical properties of the RBD itself, uh, with the ultimate goal of shedding more light on how RBD mutations may facilitate viral evolution, uh, both over kind of the pandemic timescale of SARS-CoV-2 itself, as well as some questions about the deeper evolution within this broader lineage of SARS-related coronaviruses. To do these deep mutational scanning experiments, we've been using a yeast surface display platform. This platform enables the expression of folded RBD protein on the surface of individual yeast cells, where we can then measure different, different biochemical phenotypes of an RBD variant. For example, we can use an epitope tag on the yeast displayed RBD to measure its surface expression level, uh, which is a correlate of the intrinsic folding stability of a protein variant. We can also incubate our yeast with soluble ACE2 ligand uh, to determine whether a particular RBD variant is capable of binding some ACE2 orthologue. And similarly, we can incubate with antiviral antibodies that are known to target the RBD, once again to determine how variants of the RBD impact binding by particular antibodies. So last spring, together with Ali Greeny, a graduate student in the Bloom Lab, uh, we first used this platform to make these measurements of how mutations within the RBD impact its folding and expression level, as well as, if, as its affinity for the human ACE2 receptor. To do this, of course, we started by making a mutant library of the SARS-CoV-2 RBD, uh, in which we use uh, a pretty basic NNS-based immunogenesis uh, PCR approach to introduce all of the possible amino acid mutations at each of the 201 sites in the RBD. We then used this mutant library to perform these high throughput ACE2 titration assays using this technique uh, referred to as TightSeq, uh, first described in this paper from Adams et al. in 2016. And the way this works briefly is that we take our library of yeast, each of which expresses a different RBD variant on its cell surface, and we label the library across a concentration range of uh, soluble human ACE2 protein, which is fluorescently labeled. We can then see sort of how the population of yeast cells um, responds to ACE2 labeling as we increase the concentration of ACE2 during that incubation using flow cytometry, measuring that fluorescence level of ACE2 binding. Uh, but then beyond simply observing this, you know, titration, uh, what we do is we use fluorescence activated cell sorting or FACS to partition the library into four bins from unbound to fully saturated ACE2 binding across each of these ACE2 concentrations. We then use deep sequencing to identify which cells are sorted into which bin across each ACE2 concentration. And sort of from all of this data together, we can reconstruct for each variant in the library its variant specific binding curve. So for example, the orange genotype, which does not bind ACE2, will be sorted into bin one across the entire titration range. Uh, whereas a high affinity variant, like the blue genotype, will begin to be sorted into these intermediate and saturated binding bins um, at these lower concentrations of ACE2, 
And so from these variance specific binding curves, we can kind of compute these internally normalized uh, metrics of affinity, uh, which we refer to as um, KD or KD apparent, since these are not true biochemical measurements, um, which are a proxy for the strength of binding of each of these genotypes in our library for human ACE2. Alongside the sort of titration or tight seek assay, um, we also performed a um, somewhat simpler um, kind of classic sort seek method, also to determine the effects of mutations on RBD surface expression level. So once again, that's taking advantage of a C terminal epitope tag on the RBD construct that we can label for fluorescence. And then we can simply take our library, partition it into bins of fluorescence, sequence the genotypes in each bin, and reconstruct the effect of each mutation on that RBD surface expression level. So first, I'll just go over a couple quick observations that we made about the effects of mutations on RBD expression levels, which once again is sort of this correlate of RBD folding and stability. So what I'm showing here is a heat map depiction of our data, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Uh, but just as a brief overview, in these heat maps, each row is an amino acid that we introduced at each position represented in columns. And we color the squares in this heat map according to the measured functional effect of that mutation, according to the scale bar on the left, where blue indicates mutations that increase RBD expression, and red indicates mutations that are deleterious with respect to RBD expression. And the main pattern I wanted to highlight here is um, sort of the scattering of RBD ex uh, enhancing, uh, expression enhancing mutations across this um, heat map. And we saw these kind of fall into two different categories. Uh, first, uh, what I'm showing in sort of the black squares are expression enhancing mutations that are occurring at these ACE2 contact positions as indicated by the black squares at the top. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail, but what we saw with these is that um, these mutations were actually illustrating sort of stability binding trade-offs. So even though a lot of these mutations to polar residues at these ACE2 contact positions were beneficial with respect to stability and expression, um, they were actually deleterious with respect to binding, um, indicating sort of why you know, the wild type state is the way that it is, um, despite perhaps stability decreasing implications. Um, the other kind of group of stability enhancing mutations I wanted to point out are um, the ones down here um, circled in green. And so these are sites that are far away from the ACE2 binding surface, sort of more in the folded core portion of the RBD. So to look at these mutations in a bit more detail, we worked together with Dan Ellis, who's a graduate student in Neil King's lab at the University of Washington. And so first we wanted to just know whether these mutations we were identifying from yeast display would actually translate to, you know, true expression of soluble RBD protein from mammalian cells. And so what Dan did was take uh, five of these mutations that we identified from our yeast display DMS, and he cloned them into his mammalian expression system and expressed and purified these single mutant variants of the SARS-CoV-2 RBD. And so what I'm showing here on the left um, is a gel indicating expression levels of protein across the different stages of purification. Um, and so on the left is kind of the typical yield that Dan would get for wild type SARS-CoV-2 RBD, uh, which has a couple little pathologies about it so that it doesn't really express at super high levels. Um, but what was really interesting was that Dan found that um, these five mutations that we identified from the yeast display had also super dramatic effects on soluble protein yield within a mam mammalian protein expression system. So these five different mutations all enhanced protein expression um, between two and five fold when measured via analytical size occlusion chromatography. Um, and for the most part, that corresponded with true stabilizing effects of these mutations. So when Dan took these proteins and measured their melting temperature or their TM via thermal melt curves, um, he saw that these mutations typically had um, stability enhancing effects um, as great as up to four degrees Celsius, which is you know, quite remarkable for a single amino acid change. Um, so this was pretty exciting to see validate, um, and I think uh, has some important implications when thinking about um, RBD-based reagents that are used in things like vaccines and as molecular probes for various, you know, functional experiments. So moving on now to sort of the meat of our data, um, I'm showing the equivalent heat map as before, but now with regards to our mutational effects on ACE2 binding affinity. So once again, 
This heat map is showing all of our mutations, colored blue for mutations that enhance human ACE2 binding affinity, and mutations colored red that are deleterious with respect to binding. And so I think many of us are kind of used to the uh, rich complexity of biochemical information that's present within a heat map like this, um, which obviously we can't really dig into uh, altogether today. Um, but this heat map does illustrate a lot of the, the trends that we're used to seeing. For example, um, cysteines within disulfides, like the one marked with the red arrow at 488. Um, you know, any mutation away from that cysteine is going to be deleterious for binding. Uh, whereas there's plenty of other positions where mutations are tolerated with respect to binding. Um, and one pattern that really stood out to me was, um, once again, a scattering of mutations that actually enhance human ACE2 binding affinity. This pattern, I think, is particularly pronounced if we zoom in just on the particular positions in the RBD that actually contact ACE2 itself. So, um, you know, oftentimes I feel like in demutational scanning data sets, I'm used to seeing the key residues that actually mediate function um, are those that are typically the most constrained with respect to mutational effects. However, in the case of the SARS-CoV-2 RBD, um, it seems to be a little bit different in that even when we zoom in on these most important positions, um, many of them are tolerating mutations quite well um, or even have mutations that enhance ACE2 binding. Um, even though, you know, the binding affinity of this RBD for human ACE2 is already quite tight. And so this suggests to us that this RBD has a quite, you know, plastic functional landscape where it can tolerate uh, many mutations and maintain or even improve receptor binding affinities. I'll emphasize that here even a little bit more by zooming in on sort of an atomic view of the RBD ACE2 interface where I've labeled several of these positions where we see a lot of affinity enhancing mutations. So positions 493, 498, and 501 in our map have many of these affinity enhancing mutations present. If we were just to look at the crystal structure, we would see that these look like important contact residues, right? They're part of these networks of polar contacts at the RBD ACE2 surface, usually polar contacts at surfaces we think need to be satisfied. You know, all the prior literature on crystallography from SARS-CoV-1 ACE2 interaction talked a lot about these hotspot residues on ACE2, K353 and K31, and talked a lot about how important it is to satisfy these charged residues at this otherwise largely um, hydrophobic packing interface. Uh, and so, you know, if we just take a look at the SARS-CoV-2 crystal structure, you know, we might think that these polar residues are super important here. Um, but when we look at our data, we see that these positions that look important structurally still can tolerate, you know, biochemically dramatic mutations. So N501, making that polar contact, you can mutate that to completely large, you know, nonpolar residues like tryptophan and tyrosine and, and phenylalanine and actually improve that affinity further. And so I think the kind of functional plasticity from a mutational perspective is likely mimicked even further with um, some degree of plasticity at the structural perspective or at the structural interface that's accommodating these dramatic mutations that can actually be consistent with or improve binding affinity. And then finally, I think this um, functional plasticity is underscored even further uh, if we look to the evolutionary record of the, this lineage of SARS-related coronaviruses over longer evolutionary timescales. So what I'm showing here is um, a depiction of the RBD as a surface. Um, and then I'm showing in the gray cartoon the key motifs of ACE2 with which the RBD interacts. So mapping where the ACE2 interaction interface is on this RBD as a whole. And then on the RBD surface, I'm coloring from white to green, um, according to the scale bar, uh, the variability of positions within an alignment of the broader lineage of SARS-related coronaviruses or sarbecoviruses. And so what this is showing is that, you know, many of the most conserved sites are actually far away from ACE2. Um, whereas a lot of these hotspots for evolutionary diversity are the very same positions that are contacting ACE2 itself, sort of further underscoring that there's a lot of functional plasticity, um, you know, in, embedded within this RBD ACE2 interaction. So this theme of functional plasticity within the RBD that we pulled out from our SARS-CoV-2 data set uh, really leads into uh, what I've been working on more recently that I'll tell you briefly about today. Uh, which is looking more generally at how these RBDs have been evolving over deeper evolutionary times within this lineage of SARS-related coronaviruses. So to contextualize this, I'm showing 
on the left, a phylogeny of um, the lineage of SARS-related coronaviruses, which is kind of broken up into four clades, which I'm showing in the four separate colors here. And so this lineage of viruses is, of course, you know, a, a broader array of viruses found typically in bats, um, from which, of course, SARS-CoV-2 emerged. Um, this is also the lineage from which SARS-CoV-1 emerged in the early 2000s. And then there's these other clades um, in, in Asia, as well as Africa and Europe that have um, other functional properties. And so um, what I've been working on more recently is leveraging this yeast display high throughput titration platform um, in order to conduct more systematic surveys of function and mutational effects across the diversity of SARS-related coronaviruses. So first what I did was um, take just all of the wild type RBDs, um, so all of these unique RBDs, uh, and cloned them as a library into the, my yeast display platform where I can perform these same types of titration assays. So I'm showing here um, sort of my first set of data, which was uh, just binding for human ACE2 uh, once again. Um, and we can see sort of variation across these four clades of SARS-related coronaviruses in their ability to bind human ACE2. And so this is kind of nicely validated by a lot of prior virology type of experiments, um, which illustrate you know, restriction of human ACE2 binding really to these two clades of SARS-related coronaviruses. Um, I won't get into the data today, but um, more recently we've been working um, in collaboration with David Wiesler, a biochemist at uh, professor at University of Washington, uh, to expand sort of the panel of ACE2 ligands or orthologs with which we're performing these experiments um, using uh, many of these rapidly evolving ACE2 receptors from sort of the native bat hosts in which many of these viruses are found, as well as some of these other hosts of sort of intermediate spillover potential. Beyond sort of doing this just with the wild type RBDs themselves, um, I'm also performing sort of a mini mutational scanning approach where I'm taking um, a kind of a, a panel of some of these RBDs and looking at just six of the most important ACE2 contact positions, um, these site saturation mutagenesis libraries. And so as an example, I'm showing three of the backgrounds here um, where I'm showing the, the, the binding affinity of each of these mutants of these RBDs with respect to human ACE2 binding. Um, and we're beginning to see some pretty exciting trends. Uh, for example, um, one really unique result was observing that this um, RBD from a virus in Africa, BTKY72, uh, even though it doesn't bind human ACE2 in its wild type state, um, you know, there's actually several different individual amino acid changes at several of these positions that we hit with just our limited DMS, um, which actually do confer low level human ACE2 binding. Um, and so that might really expand the sort of evolutionary and geographic breadth with which we, we think about um, potential for human ACE2 binding within this broader lineage of viruses. We can also begin to see evidence for turnover and mutational effects across the tree. Um, so what I'm showing here is just subsetting on, for example, two of the positions within this heat map uh, between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, um, where I've sort of translated the heat map view into a local plot to illustrate preferences. And so what this shows is, for example, at position 501, um, where many mutations are, you know, tolerated or enhance affinity for human ACE2 in the SARS-CoV-2 background. Um, in SARS-CoV-1, really threonine is, is really the only preferred amino acid mutation with the other states having quite dramatic decreases in human ACE2 binding affinity. And so this is pretty cool to see because, um, for example, N501Y is probably a mutation that many of us have heard about recently as it's occurring, you know, in parallel across multiple lineages of SARS-CoV-2 at the moment. Um, whereas my data suggests that, you know, the affinity enhancing effect of that mutation, which might correlate with um, increased transmissibility, uh, might be a particular effect in, you know, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 background, which could not have been predicted from prior experiments on SARS-CoV-1, where epistasis makes it such that mutation is actually not preferred for human ACE2 binding. So I'm just about up on time. I just wanted to end by uh, highlighting that there's kind of another branch of this work that I didn't really get to talk about today. Um, but both Ali and myself have been doing a lot of work as well to map how mutations within the SARS-CoV-2 RBD impact antibody binding in the context, for example, of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, um, as well as a bunch of great work from Ali in the context of polyclonal sera. Um, and a lot of these maps have really 
uh, direct implications in terms of viral surveillance within the ongoing SARS-CoV-2 pandemic itself. And so um, I encourage you to check out that work as well. So with that, I'll just quickly thank, um, once again, my advisor, Jesse, as well as Allie in the lab, um, who's been really fun to work with on so many directions of this work. Uh, lots of key collaborators and funding, and of course, the organizers of this symposium. Uh, and thank you all for listening.